For Honor is a third-person medieval hero fighter. Set in an alternative history medieval setting, Vikings, samurais and knights transcend time and geography to fight each other. While the premise may sound a tad ahistorical, the game is incredibly fun to play if you can get past the initial learning curve. Do you need a controller to play this game? I use a keyboard and mouse and I have very few complaints. My primary gripe lies with reflex guard heroes, characters that require you to keep moving your mouse in the direction of incoming attacks. I don't know if this is easier on a controller since I've never used one. If you have, let us know if reflex guards are still a pain in the comment section below. Static guard heroes are easier on the hands as they continue to block attacks from the direction you last move your mouse. For Honor is a game of preset characters, much like Rainbow Six Siege, Dota and Overwatch. Unlike Mordhau, you cannot create your own character, though you can customize the gear on the characters you have unlocked. Customization involves grinding matches with an unlocked character to unlock better gear like armor, hilts and helmets. You can also dismantle unwanted gear for crafting materials, with which you can upgrade the gear you do want to keep. Better gear unlocks passive bonuses in 4 vs 4 game modes, but more on those later. For Honor requires you to unlock new characters because instant access is a privilege for players who purchase a season pass. Buying these passes isn't necessary unless you want to support the developers. Why would you want to do this? The developers regularly update For Honor with patches that bring balance changes and new heroes as well as new maps and modes which are immediately available to all players who own the game, even if they haven't purchased the year pass. This model keeps the community together and is better than map packs like Battlefield's Premium Pass, which acquired a terrible reputation for dividing the player base. Furthermore, new heroes don't take nearly as long to unlock as, say, Rainbow Six Siege's characters. I've been playing For Honor regularly for about a year now, and I've unlocked all the characters in the game and have enough steel stockpiled to unlock 10 more heroes. And here's the crazy part. I'm on the Starter Edition. The difference between the Standard and Starter Editions lies in the time you'll take to unlock the game's roster. The Standard Edition allows you to play with all 12 launch heroes, though only three of them are customizable right off the bat. The other nine cannot be customized until you drop 500 steel for each of them. On the other hand, the Starter Edition allows you to play six launch heroes, though you can only customize three of these right off the bat with the other three requiring 8,000 steel each to enable customization. You cannot play with the remaining six heroes until you grind 8,000 steel on each of them. Both editions require players to spend 15,000 steel to play new heroes and 10,000 steel to unlock DLC heroes released in For Honor's first year. Steel is the game's grind currency, what you get for completing matches and what you use to unlock characters. That being said, For Honor lets you buy this grind currency with real money, though you'll likely never feel the need. Steel is plentiful if you complete the game's challenges, of which there are two kinds. Contracts and Daily Orders Contracts are replaced every 48 hours and award 100 to 200 steel for completing challenges like capturing a designated number of zones and playing a designated number of matches of certain game modes. Daily Orders are self-explanatory, though these offer far more steel for far less work. Complete two matches of any kind, use two different heroes, execute three heroes and so on. If you play this game, you'll do well to complete daily orders even if you haven't the time for contracts. Most of them don't take too long to complete, and completing them both rewards 800 steel. To keep things simple for players who haven't yet started the game, we'll use steel and grind currency interchangeably. How long do you need to grind to get this currency? To calculate the hourly rate of steel, we'll use information from Ubisoft themselves. Ubisoft has stated in promotional material and forum posts that it takes 8 to 15 hours to grind 8,000 steel, depending on how you play the game. This equates to a rate of 533 to 1,000 steel per hour of grinding. Taking these figures as fact, the standard edition takes 169.5 hours to 318 hours to unlock customization for all heroes, while the starter edition takes 190 to 356.5 hours. This assumes players with the starter edition unlock the hero bundle which costs far less steel than the included heroes do individually, and is hence highly recommended. We will not bore you with the method of calculation. We've covered each step of our estimation in our now outdated grind analysis video. For Honor is certainly fun enough to warrant consideration. For a start, 
Its excellent presentation will immediately draw new players in and keep them hooked with striking visuals and immersive audio design. The cacophony of clashing steel and wood works well to paint a morbid picture of medieval battle, and this authenticity is complemented by the game's graphics. The textures and level of detail on the environment and character models are exquisite, though the game isn't quite perfect yet. For instance, the fire looks a bit flat and lacks the depth and lighting effects seen in other visually impressive titles. Perhaps Ubisoft could add more detail to the flames and toss in a bloom effect for good measure. They've already overhauled the graphics once to considerable success, so this wouldn't be too much to ask for. On the other hand, further visual improvements could be argued to be unnecessary, as most players do not get time to admire anything in the heat of combat. The sound design, on the other hand, does prove useful in combat. Each move has its audio cue, which can warn you of the type of danger that is imminent even if your visual perception has been impaired by one of the game's several stuns. These cues include character voice lines, the quality of which I'm happy to report is excellent. Most of the characters are impeccably voiced with very few exceptions. A few of the Chinese heroes can sound annoying after a while. For the most part, the quality of writing and voice acting is outstanding and helps immerse you in the game's setting. The distinctive voices of the characters exude a ton of personality, even in brief multiplayer matches. Furthermore, their lines serve a tangible function as most of the characters' unique moves are tied to a specific line. If you hear that line, you know it's coming, and you'll get a split second to decide how you're going to deal with the incoming attack. On the other hand, your opponent can also use this to deceive you by triggering the audio cue with an attack that can be cancelled or transitioned into another move. Animations serve the same purpose. Thankfully, the animation is as slick and smooth as it is forceful. For Honor does not suffer from clunky and floaty movement that plagues, say, chivalry. On the other hand, some argue For Honor unrealistically exaggerates the startup of the hero's swings and stabs in order to telegraph the imminent attack and allow the target a split second to prepare. The obvious rebuttal would be For Honor is not intended to be realistic. Gameplay takes precedence over realism. The game is so much fun that you won't mind the inauthenticity. You might find that hard to believe if you have already tried For Honor when it launched and were subsequently put off by the rampant glitches and latency issues. You should know the game has come a long way since then. With that said, connectivity can still present sporadic problems since it's common for the game to disconnect you from a match in progress and kick you back to the main menu. That is if you're lucky. If you're disconnected, you will likely end up at the initial loading screen, unable to even access the main menu, let alone reconnect or start another match. While you can argue the game needs to be connected to the developer's servers in order to play multiplayer, the inability to start the single-player campaign is inexcusable. There is no reason why the game shouldn't allow you to start the story while it's offline. Sadly, For Honor uses Always Online DRM, a system that is guaranteed to kill the game once Ubisoft feels they no longer need to keep their servers up. Players will at some point be denied the product they paid for, though it could be argued this doesn't matter as much if you're going to be claiming your copy for free in Epic's forthcoming promotion. In any case, we call on Ubisoft to unshackle the single-player campaign from the persistent connection requirement. With that said, some might argue the campaign isn't worth fighting since the story is not particularly memorable to put it kindly. We still think it's worth preserving because the missions that once served as a glorified tutorial are now a valuable time capsule, preserving old mechanics that have long been removed by reworks. Raider guard breaking immediately after dodging and Lawbringer shoving his opponent after blocking their attack are just two examples. These combos were exclusive to Raider and Lawbringer and set them apart from the other heroes. Consequently, the removal of their special mechanics has stripped these characters of their individuality and made them feel less unique. Many players have argued these reworks were justified, if not overdue, as they feel these moves should never have been in the game in the first place. While you can no longer use these moves in multiplayer, you can still do so in story mode, which makes the campaign a museum of sorts. On the other hand, these missions can lead newer players astray if they play the campaign to learn the game which they may be driven to by the game's lack of reliable tutorials. 
The game does have videos that explain its heroes and modes, but these are a pain to watch due to the interface lacking a seek bar and rewind buttons. For Honor also features a training mode for heroes to explain their moveset, but these are incomplete, inadequate, and in certain instances, downright deceptive. For instance, these tutorials do teach you to parry an incoming attack by pressing the heavy attack key and how to counter attack after your opponent is staggered by your parry. However, they do not tell you that you can input a zone attack to parry instead of the heavy attack. The training modes also fail to highlight the use of zone attacks as a harassing tool of certain characters. Keep your guard up to defend attacks from the top and spam zone attacks. This technique is exclusive to characters that have fast zone attacks, such as Kensei and Warden. Fast in this case is defined as 500 milliseconds or quicker. The target has to choose between the direction your guard is indicating and the direction of your zone attack. This exemplifies For Honor as a battle of reflexes and deception. You need to be quick on your reflexes if you don't want to be caught off guard by the fastest moves in the game. On the other hand, you do not want to react prematurely lest your opponent bait an impulsive reaction and catch you with your pants down. For an example of a misleading tutorial, let's look at this Highlander exercise. You are instructed to parry a heavy attack and follow that up with a heavy attack of your own. This would never work in a multiplayer match. Each attack has an optimal counter-attack. The optimal counter-attack is called the max punish and differs depending on the attack countered. If you parry the faster light attack, you'll be able to land a more damaging heavy, though the direction you ought to attack from depends on the hero you're using. If you parry the slower heavy attack, you only get a fast light attack, though a few heroes can land their zones for more damage. However, the exercise in question as players parry a heavy attack with a heavy attack. There is only one hero that can do this, and it's not the one used in the exercise. Punishing heavy attacks with your own heavy does not work in multiplayer matches as your opponents will recover in time to parry your counter-attack. The bot used in the exercise does not bother, even though it could parry your heavy. You can see the bot is recovered by his guard's reappearance. This exercise may mislead players into using the wrong punish in multiplayer, where one wrong move can lead to losses. The tutorial should distinguish heavy parries from light parries and list the max punishes for both. The training exercises should allow the players practice against both and highlight the differences that can be used to identify the type of attack that has been parried. Ideally, the max punishes should be listed in the moveset menu that you can peruse while you're loading the map. This would make it easier to remember the correct moves for players who frequently switch heroes between matches. This begs the question, how different are the heroes really? Some heroes are more unique than others. For instance, the two Japanese heavies feel similar, while the Japanese assassin Shinobi plays like no other hero in the game. Indeed, many feel Shinobi breaks the game's mechanics, and this perception has led Ubisoft to substantially nerf the hero in the forthcoming update. So what are the game's mechanics? There are a few moves common to all characters. Dodge, fast attack for light damage, slow attack for heavy damage, zone attack which is unique to each hero but is always performed by pressing the light and heavy attack keys simultaneously. And finally, guard break, which immobilizes targets. You can counter a guard break by pressing the guard break key on reaction. But this does not work if you try to dodge or swing a heavy attack. All of these moves trigger a recovery period during which your opponent can immobilize you with a guard break. This does not apply to characters that can transition from one move to another seamlessly without a recovery period between the moves. For instance, Berserker and Gladiator can dodge and light attack. Shaolin can dodge and heavy attack. Characters are categorized by the speed of their attacks, as well as their access to transitory moves. Heroes are also distinguished by special properties on their moves such as uninterruptible attacks. Attacks that cannot be interrupted are indicated by a glint. Certain characters can block attacks from all directions simultaneously, though entering all block leaves you vulnerable to guard break. A few characters' attacks cannot be blocked under certain conditions. Attacks that cannot be blocked are indicated by an incandescent glow. These unblockable attacks can be parried by pressing the heavy attack key right before the unblockable attack lands. This seems counterintuitive and can throw newer players off, though ultimately they'll just have to get used to it. It can be quite confusing when certain characters can also use their light attacks to block and counter incoming attacks. A few heroes can dodge in the direction of the incoming attack to block it, and a few of these can punish the attacker with an attack of their own. A few characters' attacks cannot be interrupted by incoming damage, though they can still be interrupted by bashes. 
Bashes are a category of special moves available to certain characters. Bashes deal no damage, but will drain stamina and interrupt whatever the target is doing. Most bashes stagger the target for long enough to guarantee a light or heavy attack, depending on the basher in question. New characters are constructed by combining some, but not all, of these special moves. For example, berserkers have dodge light attack, as well as uninterruptible attacks, although they cannot bash their targets. Conquerors can bash their targets, though they have to dodge first. No character has access to all moves, though a few do come close. For instance, the Chinese Vanguard can dodge into heavy, dodge into light and bash its targets, staggering them long enough to guarantee a light. If they dodge before they are bashed, he can throw out a heavy attack that cannot be interrupted. If that sounds excessive, characters like Highlander, Nobushi and Shaolin have half of their moves locked behind a special stance. That might sound cumbersome, but I've found flowing in and out of Shaolin's stance to be one of the most enjoyable aspects of playing this hero. Most stances cost stamina to enter. And to be fair, most moves in the game deplete your character's stamina. If you run out of stamina, your attacks are far slower and cannot be cancelled with a feint. Furthermore, you can be knocked off your feet if you are thrown or your attack is parried. This leaves you vulnerable to incoming attacks as you get back up. Unlike your health, your stamina does regenerate although some players might feel like it takes forever. If you're one of them, you might enjoy playing as a Chinese heavy hero, as his unique stance can rapidly regenerate stamina. Unlike the other characters, he can enter this stance even if he is exhausted. New characters occasionally bring new mechanics, as was the case with Black Prior. This hero brought the Bulwark Counter, a move that could counter all moves in the game bar the guard break. New heroes are also accompanied by new feats, which you can think of as For Honor's version of score streaks. While most of these are standard gaming mechanics like more health, health regeneration and stamina regeneration, a few do break the bounds of the game's setting. For instance, Shaolin's teleportation feats do feel out of place even in an alternate history environment. For Honor is not science fiction. Or maybe it is. Maybe it's explained in the story. I wouldn't know. I didn't pay it enough attention. If the feats bother you, you can stick to 1v1 duel or 2v2 brawls where they cannot be used. On the contrary, if you enjoy the additional abilities feats offer, you will enjoy the 4v4 modes, of which there are quite a few. For Honor has a standard deathmatch or team deathmatch to be more accurate, wherein you team up with three other players to fight a team of four opponents, human or AI. If you prefer fighting for objectives, Dominion might be right up your alley. You fight to conquer and control designated zones, like conquest in Battlefield. If you prefer capture the flag, you could try the tribute mode Ubisoft introduced back in For Honor's first year. Alternatively, you could play the more recent edition, Breach, For Honor's take on the operations mode from Battlefield. Breach has you protect and escort a battering ram as it knocks down gates and grants access to the next sector, finally culminating in a fight against an AI-controlled boss that the other team has to protect. All of these modes reward teamwork, and I mean literal rewards. You get more points for defending captured zones and reviving down teammates. You also get rewarded for executing enemies, which somehow recovers a good deal of your health and stamina, as well as prevents the enemy from reviving your victim. As you might have guessed, Ubisoft introduces new modes from time to time, though their longevity can vary greatly. While Tribute and Breach have become permanent fixtures, the same cannot be said for seasonal events like Soul Rush and the Assassin's Creed crossover. These modes are temporary and cannot be played after the event has ended. While it's unfortunate to lose access to any part of the game, some might argue this is better than the mode overstaying its welcome. For instance, it would appear players prefer Dominion as it takes considerably longer to find a match for Tribute or Deathmatch. This makes it a pain to complete the challenges that require you to play a certain number of Deathmatch or Tribute matches. I often resort to queuing against AI, just to reduce the number of players needed to find a match. But the existence of these modes is appreciated, as it's always nice to have variety. On that note, Ubisoft should be commended for not restricting access to the new modes behind a paywall like Battlefield's premium passes used to. Unlike new heroes, new modes are immediately available to all players who have the game, even if they haven't purchased a year pass. As with everything, there are exceptions. The Marching Fire update introduced Arcade Mode, which could be played solo or cooperatively. 
but this mode is locked behind a $30 marching fire expansion, which feels like a troubling departure from the free map business model Ubisoft had pioneered with Rainbow Six Siege and continued with For Honor. With that in mind, I have not purchased the expansion. If you have bought the expansion, let me know what I'm missing out on in the comment section below. And that concludes our take on For Honor. If you like this video, please share it. If you have a game you'd like us to analyze, let us know in the comment section below. There is more content like this in the way, so please like, subscribe, and press the bell button so you don't miss out. Several subscribers have reported that YouTubers screw them with their notifications, even when the bell button is enabled. So if that's true, just keep an eye out for our thumbnails. New videos will also be announced on Twitter, so please follow us over there too. Link is in the comments and the description below. We have a secondary channel we're using as a backup, just in case. So head over to there and like and subscribe that one too. While you're here, feel free to watch our analysis on Denuvo's history and performance impact, our analysis of Battlefield 5's controversies and our hardware analysis of CPUs and graphics cards.